Why would Jesus choose a tax collector to be his disciple? Let's first note a few things about taxes and tax collecting or the tax collectors. Are taxes bad in itself? Oh. <laughs> we live in a society where we need government, don't we? Even during Jesus' time, taxes are now normally used for public good. So taxes in itself are not bad. We can read in Luke 20, Jesus was asked about taxes, and Jesus says, well, look at the coin. Who does it belong to? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That money belongs to the government, to the public. And then in Romans 13, 6, we read, this is also why you pay taxes. This is God speaking to his people this is why you pay taxes, for the authorities, the government, are God's servants who give their full time for governing. If taxes are good to have, therefore tax collecting in itself should not be a problem, but sadly, we do run into a problem when it comes to money, doesn't it? For the love of money is the root of all evil. So what was the problem with the tax collectors during Jesus' time. He calls Levi a tax collector. What, what is wrong with tax collectors during that time? Anybody know? They were thieves. They robbed people. They asked more than, kind of like what our government does now <laughs> in many cases. Taxes and tax collecting were not bad in themselves, but the problem during that time was that tax collectors made money for themselves beyond what was required. They required more money from people than was necessary. They took advantage of this system of taxes. Taxes in themselves are not bad, but when people go beyond and they look for their own benefit, then it becomes a problem. And part of the problem with tax collectors during that time, remember they were under Roman Empire, they were collecting taxes for the Roman Empire, who besieged Israel. Tax collectors during Jesus' time were Jews doing the dirty work of the Roman Empire. So tax collectors not only robbed people, but they were also seen as traitors. Tax collectors during Jesus' time were robbers and viewed as traitors. That's why the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, accused Jesus of calling Levi and fellowshipping with all of these tax collectors because they were robbers and they were traitors. But Jesus went ahead and called this tax collector named Levi, also known as Matthew, to become a disciple, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus choose a tax collector to be his disciple? Any, any thoughts before we move forward? Any, any idea at all? That's why Jesus came. He says it. And so, 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 so we, we, we go forward. First of, all, first of all, Jesus also knew Levi's heart. Do you see the picture? <laughs> Levi is sitting there. He's not doing anything. He's just collecting money and making money for himself. What a job. And Jesus comes along and says, Levi, I want you to be a disciple. And he got up, left everything, and followed Jesus because Levi had a good heart. He was prepared. The spirit was working. Uh, note verse 28 again of our text, uh, Luke 5. What does that say about Levi? Verse 28. Uh, yeah, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. So Levi, Jesus knew that Levi's heart was ready, so he calls on him. So that's one reason why Jesus called this tax collector Levi. But Jesus calls on sinners. He, Jesus knew he was a sinner, and obviously Levi saw that he was a sinner. Then he followed Jesus. Jesus calls on sinners to repent to change, to turn around, to do the right thing, and to be renewed. That comes together. Repentance cannot happen unless you're renewed by God, 
Only the power of God can you really do the right thing. So let us note that Levi was a robber and a traitor, but he ended up writing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ that we're reading right now, and it will be eternal. The sinner, Levi, the robber, called by Jesus. And he was asked to write the Gospel of Matthew. How about you and me? We're sinners as well. But Jesus is calling you too. We'll come to that a little bit later. Look at verse 29. What can we note from verse 29? Look at that again. Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others. What can we say about that? What can we note? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he... He knew he was guilty, but he went ahead and asked God to enter into his house. Come, Jesus. And then what did he do? What did he, who did he invite? He invited his friends. Do you think Levi knew that they were as guilty as he was? You see, one of the other reasons why Jesus called a sinner, called this tax collector, is for evangelism. <laughs> God knew that he could use Levi, Matthew, to bring his friends so that Jesus could speak to them as well because Jesus and God loves every person in this world and will reach out to them however he can. And let us not forget, and we'll come back to that evangelism part later in our applications, but a uh, uh, fourth reason why Jesus called uh, the tax collector, let us not forget the religious leaders who were trying to trap Jesus. What was Jesus doing through this tax collector, Levi? Well, we, I think we can note that Jesus was telling the religious leaders to look beyond themselves and reach out to the sick. And he was using Levi to teach those Jewish leaders. Those Jewish leaders thought they had it all figured out. So what does Jesus do? He picks someone that knew would spark this interest, this questioning and Jesus now has an opportunity not only to talk to Levi's friends who were tax collectors and sinners, but Jesus now has an opportunity to share the good news with these religious leaders that thought they had it all figured out and saw themselves better than anyone else. That's what they were doing. They had pride issues, and Jesus was getting in their way. These Jewish leaders, just like the tax collectors, abused their power over people, and so when they saw Jesus was disrupting what they had, they had it all going. They were uh, well you know, provided for because they were in the top of the heap of this order in that Jewish faith. And Jesus comes along and was disrupting what these religious leaders had and so these leaders accused Jesus of wrongdoing. So how did Jesus respond to those accusations of those pious religious leaders? They accused Jesus of fellowshipping with sinners. Look at verse 32. How did Jesus respond? It is, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came to this world to seek and save the lost. Let us not forget that. If we're going to follow Jesus, we too have to seek and save the lost through the gospel. We can get so caught up in our church and all the functions and emotions and praising and all the hoopla of the church when we forget that we are called to seek and save the lost. You know, I, I, I and, and be praying. South Milwaukee needs the Lord. But we need to pray. How are we going to do that? whether we really do need to stay here in South Milwaukee. So, Jesus came to seek and save sinners. This was opposite to what the Jewish leaders were looking for. You know what the Jewish leaders were looking for? And, and it happens in many supposedly Christian churches today, and obviously a lot of cults out there. They look for people that are willing to follow whatever they tell them. 
and Jesus was looking for sinners who sees themselves that are wrong and to be changed, the Jewish leaders were looking for good works in people. You see the difference. Jesus was looking for sinners to save. The Jewish leaders were looking for good works in order to be saved. The Jewish leaders were teaching, you need to do this and this and this and this. Forget about the love of God, the forgiveness of what Jesus is saying, that he's going to die for your sins. No, you've got to do these, these things, these things, these things, good works. Fast and pray. And then these pious religious leaders accused Jesus, again, of not fasting and prayer, these good works. So what did Jesus say? We'll read in verse 34. Jesus answered, can you make the guest of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? What was Jesus saying? Jesus' first response was that celebration is to occur when Jesus is present. Yes, we are to praise and, 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 and enjoy the goodness of God, but it's through the presence of Jesus Christ. I had to respond to an email today about this, this spiritual movement, about the Holy Spirit doing his thing. The first question that came to my mind, are they really honoring Jesus Christ and calling Jesus' presence in their movement, in that church, or are they just so caught up in the spirit and the emotions of things? Be careful. The devil can mask himself as the spirit of light. It is Jesus Christ who is Lord and to be honored and glorified. And there is celebration that is to occur when Jesus is present. Jesus also responded to accusations of wrongdoing with parables. Now, a parable is a short story to illustrate a godly principle. So look again at verses 36 to 39, these parables. Jesus told them, no one tears a patch from the new garment and sews it into an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. What was Jesus trying to say here? In general, simply, what Jesus was trying to say is that I am the new covenant. Yes, I, I brought you the old covenant in the Old Testament, but I've been telling you that there will be a new covenant that will happen, and I am it. There is going to be a new relationship between people and God, and it is through Jesus Christ. It is through me. I am the new of everything. Salvation by grace, not by works. That's what Jesus was sharing with them. In general, what was Jesus trying to tell those leaders? Look back with me to uh, Luke chapter 4, because these Jewish leaders have been sticking around, hanging around for a long time, trying to accuse Jesus. Look at verse 43 of Luke 4. Remember what Jesus said there? He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. Jesus was sent to preach, preach the good news, the new covenant. And he was telling the Jewish leaders, this is what it is all about. It is the new relationship, the new covenant that will happen when I die on that cross. Jesus was teaching the religious leaders the good news of God's kingdom. Jesus gave the opportunity for those religious leaders to turn around and believe in God and what God is providing through grace through me to believe in the forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ. But what happened? The Jewish leaders were telling Jesus, no, no. We have a belief. You borrow from us. You learn from us. Then we'll all be fine. 
because we're already set. And again, Jesus told them, no, there is something new. I am that something new. Nothing to be borrowed from anything else. It is completely new. I thought of this because I was thinking of a title. But isn't this appropriate? Jesus is something new. Nothing borrowed. Even in our old flesh, we got all this old stuff. Jesus doesn't want any of that. Jesus wants the renewal, the new that he gives us every day. So that's part of the biblical principles that we are to apply today. But let's uh, go back to the basics. What biblical principles can we apply to our lives today? Jesus called Levi a sinner to become a disciple. Today, Jesus is still calling people, calling sinners to repent, calling you and I to, to turn around from our old stuff, don't borrow from it, and go to the new of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Christ. And so first of all, we need to be renewed if you have never done so, confess to God that you are a sinner, just like Levi, that you have sinned against God, and Jesus Christ is the only Savior and the only Lord of your life. If you've never done so, may I encourage you today to do that, that only Jesus is your Savior, that only Jesus is your God, and that you are a sinner. You are termed to be judged eternally but only by believing in Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins will save you from that judgment, but only be re not only be renewed because of that belief, you need to repent and turn around, say no to the master of your old life, and say yes to the master of your new life with Jesus Christ. It comes together, not just one part. And you say, well, I'm saved by grace, but, and I can do whatever I want. Is there really belief in Jesus Christ? And I've heard it often. They say they're Christians because they believe in Jesus Christ because of the salvation that he's given and forgiven of their sins. And they say, well, you know, then I can do whatever I want. I can sin because I can always go to the cross. Be careful. Because when Jesus says, believe in me, he's not only saying that I died for your sins, but I am God and your Lord. We need to commit to the Lordship of Christ. So confess to God that you are a sinner and Jesus Christ is your only Savior and Lord of your life. Secondly, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling each one of us to be a disciple. It comes together. It's this whole uh, package of, of, of believing in the forgiveness of sins, following Jesus Christ, then you become a disciple. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Remember what we said last week? Disciples are to follow, learn, and imitate their teacher. We are to learn, to follow, focus on Jesus. We are to learn and imitate Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling us to do. And then uh, we need to know that when uh, Jesus called Levi, Levi was so excited that he invited all his friends to meet Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Let's say that you were fortunate enough to get a ticket to watch the final game of the World Series where the Brewers were playing, and it's the top of the ninth, and the Brewers were, uh, are, it's a tied game, and Prince Fielder gets up there and whack! He whacks a home run to win the game, and you see this ball coming right at you, and you hold out your hand and plop! <laughs> the winning baseball of the World Series for the Brewers lands in your hand. What are you going to do with that baseball? What are you going to do with that baseball? Take it home? I hope so, you take it home. Or, you know, if you're nice like me, I'll give it to a little kid. <laughs> I will take it home. What else will you do with it? Will you lock it in a safe? Tell, not tell anybody? What are you going to do with it? Show it to your friends. This is a fantastic. Did you see what I did? You see me on TV? I got this ball. This you treasure that baseball because something incredible happened. Will you treasure that ball more than Jesus Christ? 
Are we telling our friends about Jesus Christ? If we really think about it as a Christian, Jesus Christ is the greatest treasure we have in our lives. Are you taking him home? Are you sharing him with your friends who needs to hear this good news? Treasure Jesus Christ. Treasure Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of what will happen. When you treasure Jesus Christ, like you would treasure that baseball because it has meaning, you will be excited to share Jesus to others. And that is God's desire for you to be excited about Jesus Christ. You see, yes, we are to evangelize. We are to go out there and preach the good news. But you know, the key to evangelism, the key for you to share the good news of Jesus Christ is because you need to be excited of what you have. If you're not excited, you're not going to tell anybody. You'll just put it in your pocket. How excited are you with Jesus Christ in your life? The key to evangelism is how much you really understand how much God loves you. You say you're a Christian, you understand God's love. But you know, in Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, the Apostle Paul prays for the Christians to know more and more of God's love. They're already Christians, but the Apostle Paul is praying that those Christians would know more of God's love, more and more and more and more, because he knew through God's revelation that as God understands and treasures Jesus Christ and his love, we will share it to others. May I encourage you to pray for one another, pray for me, that I would learn the love of Christ, the love of God more and more in my life, that I would treasure Jesus Christ. Would you commit to praying for one another as well, that you would know the love of God for you more and more and more and more until you see him face to face and you hug him and you give him thanks. And the great thing is that he will hug you as well. And the word of God tells us he's going to hand you a stone with a special name for you. That's how much God loves you. One last thing. The religious leaders who confronted Jesus did not want to hear anything new. They thought they had it all figured out. They thought they knew all the answers. Do you ever hear Christians like that, supposedly? They know everything. Jesus told them everything is new with Christ. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He is the new garment. He is the new wineskin. He is the new wine. Jesus is something new, nothing borrowed. He is it. He is the newness of life and eternal life. And so again, let us be careful of having attitudes like those of the religious leaders of old who did not listen to Jesus. Even as Christians, we will not know everything. I'm learning every day, and I have to learn to humble myself to say, Lord, teach me. What are you trying to say here? That needs to be our attitude. Until we get to heaven, we will not know everything. We are to learn on a daily basis. We are still disciples of Christ. So always humble yourself in the sight of the Lord every day. Jesus always has something new for you every day. Let me say that again. Jesus always has something new for each one of us every day. Are you looking for that? Are you experiencing that? Or do you just kind of, yes, I know Jesus, and you put him aside. Jesus wants to bring something new into your life every day. So every day, would you commit to listening and learning from Jesus, the Word of God, and our relationship through prayer? How are we doing? Jesus wants to bring something new to you every day. Would you start right now? Just take a moment to pray. And then make a commitment. Whatever time it is, maybe pick a time, 3.03 in the afternoon, you will listen to Jesus and talk to Jesus. May you make a commitment, take a moment to pray about these things.